All right, welcome everybody here to our home group. Um, I know I'm so excited to be back after I couldn't make it last time with sick kiddos, so I really felt like I needed this. I was so excited. So is it just me or is this kind of like a hardish time of the year sometimes with homeschooling? Like you're kind of all about to go nuts because you've been stuck in your house or really not able to just go out and do something Maybe fun, like go to the park like you want to do, or everyone's sick, or I'm constantly sick, and it's just a lot. I saw a hilarious acrostic this morning when I was checking my email, and it was that, what MARCH stands for, like M-A-R-C-H, and it says moms are rethinking their choice to homeschool, <laughs> and I thought that totally fits. I know I had a day last week, I'm like, I just don't know if I can do this, this is just over my head. So if you're anything like me and finding yourself just struggling and just feeling like, okay, are we going to make it through? Because it's just, like I say, kind of blonde dreary anyways with the weather and everything. But spring is coming. Things will get better. We'll be out in the sunshine, you know, t-ball, swimming, whatever. We'll be starting. And for all those days that are just, you feel like you're failing, maybe you're just grumbling with your kids or yelling too much or you're letting feeling like you're letting too go of too many things or you're pushing everyone too hard whatever wherever you stand in that line i have this a hymn that i've been listening to a bit that's just been the sweetest thing for me so i'll share some of it with you and but it's called his mercy is more so what love could remember no wrongs we have done omniscient all-knowing he counts not their sum thrown into the sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more so holding on to that. On those days that are just kind of rough and you feel like you're barely hanging in there, God's mercy is more than all of our sins and all of our struggles with homeschooling because it can be so hard sometimes. So um, I will introduce Sharon Pilling here in just a sec, but at first, um, I know Olivia's mom has something she was going to share with us, this really great idea. Well, I hope you think it's a great idea. I do. Um, I'm from Ohio, and my name's Deborah Spencer. I am Olivia's mother. And I don't know if any of you know this, but two months ago at your home group, I broke my hip. And the Lord just kind of got my attention that this is, um, I'm not going back to Ohio, so my house just closed on Tuesday. And I am permanently here in Iowa with my daughter, and I'm living with her. I feel very blessed that I was able to get acquainted with a lot of women in Ohio who homeschooled. One church in particular, uh, let me think, was Heritage uh, Bible Church, and they are all homeschool moms. There's about 20 homeschool moms with about 100 kids, and one of the moms came up with this awesome idea that I was going to be involved in, but the Lord had different plans, so I thought, well, you know what? I was supposed to be involved in this. I'll just kind of throw it out there to Olivia's home group and see if they're interested. They started a clothing swap, and what they did was the moms and some of their friends would bring clothes that their children no longer wore, and they would have a clothing swap like every six months or every quarter of the year, and there would be no cost you would just, oh, I need a six for my son or daughter or whatever. And it was shoes, clothing, snowsuits, whatever. Well, it took off so well that they ended up making a clothing swap for the moms, the dads. Now they are, they are doing like small appliances, not getting into anything big that cannot fit into a van, but it's just expanded because there is no cost to it. But I was telling um, Sharon that... I would like to do something different. If you guys were interested, it has to be a person to coordinate it. I will be willing to do that. Not next month. I want to give myself a, another month to kind of get my feet 
working a little bit better, but uh, sometime in May to um, maybe have a can drive, like if you bring in canned goods or something, and then as local churches, your church community, all of you, we would take it to like a food bank or um, a church where there's a needy family or whatever. And these are just ideas. I'm just kind of throwing it out there. Livy says you guys have a Facebook group, so if you're interested, let her know, and we'll take it from there. All right, thanks. Well, I think that's so great. And as awful as it is to break a hip, I'm glad God decided to stick you here. Because I think you're going to be such a wonderful blessing to all of us. So, yes, I'm really, I'm really excited to have you here with us. So, all right. How about I go ahead and pray, and then I'll, and then I'll um, introduce Sharon. So, Holy Father, I just thank you so very much for blessing each one of us with the gift of being able to school our children at home. And I just pray that you'll help us as we try to educate them and help them to just grow in their knowledge and wisdom of you first and foremost, and then to build character and then to also just become learners of the world and just be able to be productive members of society that um, just live to glorify you, Lord. I pray that you'll um, help us throughout this as we end our years, if that may be, our school year, if that's um, the plan, or um, just or taking spring breaks and whatnot, just help us to be able to get the rest that we need and to have the energy that we need to um, just keep on plowing through. And I just pray that you'll bless each one of us with just so much joy in this journey and, and not just those struggles, but help us just be content with where we are and to enjoy it. In your holy name I pray. Amen. All right, so I was thinking earlier about Sharon. I feel like um, I've heard her speak several different times, and each time listening to her speak, it's almost like reading a great book because you're always going to hear not just like facts and information, but you're going to hear life skills or wonderful um, things she learned from that's in the form of a really good story that, that she's experienced. And her stories always stick with me. I know. I'm always like, oh, that's the lady that said this or that, you know, that whenever I'm talking to Olivia or someone, because, um, yeah, she just, she has so much wisdom to share, and I so dearly enjoy her. So Sharon here was born and raised in Iowa and became a believer in the eighth grade. She learned about homeschooling when she was just 18 years old from some friends at church and immediately embraced the concept. I think that's so cool. However, homeschooling was illegal in most states and including Iowa at the time. Having heard that if you have your teaching certificate, most states would leave you alone, so her major in college was confirmed, elementary education. Years later, Sharon married a farmer, Jim, in 1986. Jim and Sharon have a total of three children, and thankfully homeschooling was legalized in Iowa when their oldest turned four. Praise God. All of their children were educated using the skills of their parents, fellow homeschooling parents, loving relatives, Sunday school teachers, pastors, and in the final years, community college too. All of their children have graduated from college with either two or four-year degrees and are now married and raising their own children in the Lord, for which Sharon and Jim give him praise. So, thank you very much, Sharon. You want to give me back my notes? Yes. (laughs) You would have a very, very short talk. Um, I didn't think I was nervous at all about doing this talk. I've been on panels here. I've never had to stand up here by myself and do this. So um, then I told Olivia, I did all this. It took me four or five hours. I put my notes together. I sat down and I went through it and I went 30 minutes. You guys get 30 minutes is all I could come up with. Um, And I, I just shook my head going, that long to come up with that short of it? But in high school, how long did you work on a speech that took 10 minutes and you still spent hours? Um, and Olivia said, it'll be fine. We'll do a Q&A, some discussion questions. It'll be fine. Then I thought I wasn't nervous, and I went to sleep last night, and I had a great night's sleep, the best I've had in a very long time. However, I woke up to the strangest dream. There were 200 of you here today. <laughs> Half of you or more were in the parking lot in chairs. Others of you were in some kind of awning thing, sitting in scattered ways. 30 of you were people from my past that I didn't know were coming. And all the children represented were playing amongst you as you were trying to listen. And then I woke up and remembered that this is not the way it was going to be today. It was going to be a small group, and the children are well contained downstairs and in the back room. So I, I, don't, I didn't think I was nervous, but I guess I am a little bit. 
Um, I want to say that when Olivia asked me on the, to pick from the topics, I had a really hard time this year. And this was the one I thought, all right, I could try to make this one work, but none of the other topics even came close. And then I told her as the months went by, I kept forgetting what the topic really was. And I thought, is it, was it have fun? Was it, the word exciting never came to my mind. When I saw that today on the Facebook group, I went, exciting? I'm supposed to make this exciting? I don't know that I can do that, but um, I can make it more fun maybe, or um, less stressful, more joyful, some of those ideas. We all wear lots of hats, but personally, I don't take any of mine off. So when I do this talk, it's going to sound more like, homeschooling, parenting, being a wife, the whole thing. I can't separate it. I have never been able to separate it. When people have asked me the question, how do you separate, how do you be a mom that homeschools and the mom and the wife? And I said, I don't separate them. I'm all of it all the time. So I never worried about that. So, um, so you're going to get the whole snowball of wax, whatever. Um, uh, and I'm going to probably pause and look down. I'm having troubles with my voice since last August, so I also may need some water now and again. Um, and I just, just to keep on track. And some of my notes went upside down. Okay. And then I wondered too, when I saw the word exciting, I thought, why do we have to make things exciting? Why can't things just be kind of status quo? And then the excitement when it happens, it really is exciting. Um, we don't plan our mountaintop experiences in life. They just happen, and they are mountaintops because the rest of life is just like this. And so I don't, I don't know that anything I tell you today is going to give you mountaintops or joy and excitement every day of your homeschool career. And I, I, I do remember the days when, especially this time of year, when you were like, I don't know. What, what should we just stop doing right now? Because I've had my days are full enough. I don't care about doing this topic anymore the rest of the school year. What do I give up now? And actually, that is how I we started our homeschool year by adding one subject a week or so until we were in everything, and then we ended our homeschool year taking off one subject until we were down to nothing. Um, we just had to decide which one of those topics was going to get the shaft each year, and usually it was the ones that. I didn't like, not the ones that they didn't like. Um, although I'm not sure that they loved any particular topic. Um, so I thought too we ought to keep our eyes on the goal of education, and I'm not talking about being Christian homeschoolers, but the goal of education period, to teach a love of learning and the ability to self-teach. And in an essay I learned a new word this past month, autodidact, and it's self-teaching. It, if you look at the, what the two root words mean, the auto and the didact, we teach ourselves. And that's what we want to do. We want to teach our children to love learning and to be able to teach themselves um, in any area of their interest or their needs. And we do the same thing uh, in areas that are far less exciting, like how many of you have ever had to figure out how to prepare your taxes? It's not fun to learn that, but it's great when it's in the mail. So sometimes our learning skills are not exciting to learn, but the ways that we can apply them and the outcomes are exciting or give us peace. And, and um, so I thought of a couple other examples like fractions. When you're teaching fractions, it can be very painful, especially when the child just doesn't quite get it. But when they can measure out a recipe and know those fractions and not have to look them all up and even change a recipe to double it, then that's exciting when they can apply that. So even though you struggled through this teaching of the fractions, the joy part may be coming later when they can work in the kitchen and not have to worry about um, making a mistake, although we still all do that. Sometimes I've had to double recipes because I accidentally doubled something, and that's not, that's not fun. Um, in the early years, you're just going to be introducing them to so many things to help them explore while they still have enthusiasm and while they still care. Um, as they grow, you're going to watch and you're going to listen and you're going to ask to discover the things that do interest them or drive them. And then you're going to give them more of that if possible, as long as it's reasonable. Because some things aren't reasonable. They want, may want more of something that you just can't give them more of. Just like we do. We might want more of a hobby that we don't have time for, but we have to have self-control and wait. With the younger children, you're going to give them lots of free time, which I'm sure a lot of you already do, with things like water play, um, colored 
dyed water, um, regular sand, kinetic sand. I learned about kinetic sand for the first time with grandchildren. I love that stuff. So I even bought some with some Kohl's cash to have at my house so that we can have kinetic. And my daughter says, Mom, did you buy that for your own therapy? I said, well, maybe, maybe. Um, bins of rice and beans to measure, simple games, playtime with balls and balloons, bubbles, chalk, Play-Doh. I'm listing all the things you already have in your house. Lacing cards. Toys that spawn creativity like um, vehicles, plastic animals, blocks, Duplo, simple puzzles, and Fisher Price Little People. I collected those at garage sales long after our kids were way past that stage, and my grandkids spend hours playing with our Fisher Price Little People. Before they changed them to the fat big people that you couldn't choke on, the little people that were the more classic ones in the older um, little buildings. We have a room in the back of our house um, that we can spread that out in a big circle. Olivia's kids have also set them all up and played with them in the back room for hours, even as old as Deborah's age, have played with them for hours together. And so those were that that's the younger age. And then as they get older, they're going to expand to other things like modeling clay. And we gave our daughters especially got interested in modeling clay for a while. And so we had an old kitchen table in our basement, and they spread out, and they built with a cardboard foundation an entire modeling clay village that we left up for many, many months. And when we finally decided to take it down, we took it down in sections and put it in big tubs because we couldn't destroy it yet. It was that special. And they did things like, you know, made popsicle cabin, popsicle stick cabins, but then they smeared brown clay on the outside. I mean, it was very detailed. They had a pond, and you could see things like the duck's tail sticking out of the water and a fish jumping through. They, they really were, and they were older, probably 8 to 12 in that area when they were doing that kind of thing. So the older they get, you're going to supply different types of art supplies, manipulatives, games. The games are going to get more complicated. We had Playmobil as gifts. Some of those are more uh, too easily to destroy. Other than, I mean, Lego's not as easy to destroy. Some of the Playmobil is a little more fragile, um, so we so we waited till they were a little bit older for some of that. The Lego, um, and we tried to keep mostly at the Lego that was the more basic stuff, not the more themed stuff that they moved into more later in the later years. Now there's so much themed, but they still have the basics. I also have about four or five sets that are at my house that I don't let go out of my house that the grandkids can play with. And even my son, who took all his Legos with him, um, so I didn't have any Legos in the house, he bought me a set of Legos um, for the kids to play with that even laid up and is a really cool set. And so they've played with that one at our house too. Um, and he's it was such a creative thing for him that he's got his girls so involved now that they go to Lego build clubs and they win Lego stuff at those Lego build clubs. So it's it's a toy that can last for generations and um, you can do a lot with it. We also used Lego to build a not to scale model of our new addition of our house so that we could kind of get an idea and the kids were old enough that they could kind of get an idea. This is going to be the new living room and this is going to be the new kitchen and dining room and so some of those tools have a lot of application right away. Um, investigative tools like magnifying glass, um, simple science kits. My grandson just got some, I, don't, I can't remember the name of the company, but he just got four or five of them from one of his uncles that were the, kind of made of the thick balsa wood, and then you just put them together to see how something works, like how does a pinball machine work, that kind of thing. You can begin them on collections, like insects, rocks, shells, buttons, sports cards. And you can build creative activities out of those to tie some of your homeschool studies to them. Um, even history might work with a Playmobil, a Playmobil set if it's the right period. And I brought um, some of your experiments won't be as perfect as you hoped either. I love rocks. And we got a rock tumbler at one point, And we, we spent good money, not the, the little cheap one, but we spent good money on it and um, used some of our rocks that we found at Lake Michigan. And I brought these so you can see that none of these are perfect. They still are, some of them have pit, pitted areas and rough areas that didn't polish up as nice as the ones you buy in the store that are already polished. So some of your experiments and some of your creative times aren't going to be as perfect as you, as you hope, but it's still fun. Except it's not fun when the, uh, uh, when the rock tumbler makes a lot of noise and it has to run all night long. And so it has to go to the basement and... Um, that was, that was the one drawback on that one. 
Same with a food dehydrator, guys. They have to run all the time, too, and they can't run it near the bedroom. So, all right, and then when they get older grades, it may take a lot more to keep them excited. Um, I think some of the things that excited my kids the most in high school was that I let them be free to do things on their own timetable again, you know, and I didn't make them schedule it in with me because they didn't need me as much as they did in the earlier years. Um, you're going to teach them a lot to cover, let's see, sorry, I don't have an Okay, so you're going to teach some basics that are not as fun for individuals, like the things I said that we need to learn, like how to do taxes. Um, our son Daniel had two jobs during high school, too, that were not fun. One was detasseling, and he was the oldest one on the crew, the only one that could drive the machine. So they put him in charge of driving the machine, and that made him in charge of all the other kids that wouldn't do their work well. So he learned some really hard things, how to drive a detasseling machine and how to be in charge of other kids that were really kind of his peers. Um, but those were, that was a good, those were good skills for him, even though it was a hard time. So we provided that by letting him go do that job. He also had a job at Arby's in high school, and nobody enjoys, really enjoys working at a fast food place, um, except for the leftovers that you might get to bring home at the end of the day. But he learned a lot there, too, and he was very appreciated in, in that role as well. So even as adults, we do have to have, we do do the mundane part of life, but we can look forward to the things that we really enjoy. Like, as I mentioned before, um, we, we want to do our hobbies, too. We want to take time to do our scrapbooking or play sports, but we still have to do the mundane parts of life, too. And we, that's something, when I kept thinking, how do I make this exciting? A lot of life is not exciting. So... We have to teach them that, too, that all of life is not exciting, but that we can plan for those exciting things. There are exciting times that we can have. It's just not all the time. It's not going to be all the time. Um, and I, um, I listened to, I'm doing a free class on brain retraining for food carb addictions and pain, um, chronic pain and a couple other things. They're helping retrain the brain. And one of the things that they suggested today was to think back of a time that gave you joy or was exciting for you or whatever. And I thought, oh, that's what I'm doing today. I'm teaching this class on the, or telling this, doing this talk. And so they just said, think back, close your eyes if you need to, and think back of a time when things were really exciting, a day, an event in your homeschool life, and just have hope and remember that yeah, there'll be, there'll be exciting times and joyful times again, even if this week is not one of those times. They will come again. So if you can kind of go back to some of those memories and say, okay, this, this week is not representative. This week is a rough week, or this day is not representative. Or even the course of a, an, a day, this hour is not representative of what life really will look like going forward. And then there may be... Um, drink. Pause for a drink. It just gets gravelly. And I don't know what's going on. You can pray for me on that if you think of it. I love to talk. And um, ever since I had a cold in August that had a really bad cough, my voice has never been quite the same since. Um, there are many homes, or there are many whole family or smaller group activities. So I talked about younger children getting older, reaching the older grades, and now I want to move on to um, whole family or small group or paired off activities for all ages. So we can do family game nights. You can set up tournaments um, for short games like checkers. Um, you could trade games with other families. Your family's tired and bored of the games you've got. Maybe maybe that's one of the things we can tell. Um, uh, Olivia's mom, maybe we can have a game trade, too, or a game, and, and if you want your game back, you just make sure that you know that the family that borrows that one knows that. Um, that way you can get a variety of games going on without a lot of cost. And somewhere I have added to our supply of things at home like that is hopefully yours. Their prices are rock bottom compared to any place else, and I think they're pretty careful to make sure that most of the parts are there, and they sometimes label them if they're not. So that's a good, and they'll let you open them if, and check and then retape them if you're not going to buy them. So that's some of the activities. Um, read alouds, both for pleasure and for school. Don't forget about pleasure reading for yourself and for your kids. Um, not everything doesn't have to be assigned. I asked a family at church who homeschools um, all high schoolers now, I think, um, what exciting things are you reading right now that mom did not assign? 
and so they were able to tell me a few books that they were they were reading. Um, we used to do a lot of read aloud because we read aloud for pleasure and we read aloud for history, we read aloud for Bible, and so I let them do things like coloring with the Dover coloring books because there's so many different history or topics that Dover Company um, has, and they've also cut out a ton of Dover paper dolls from all the time periods while we were reading about those time periods. And if they could do it quietly, they played with Legos and things like that while we were reading aloud. Um, every once in a while you do have to ask them questions about what you were reading to make sure that their minds are. Some kids can do it and some kids can't do it. And so um, you just have to work that out with your kid. Um, children can read aloud to you as well as to each other and younger to older and older to elderly in elderly care centers. They love children and some of them, their eyes are not good enough to read to themselves anymore, um, which would be a very sad state of life to me because I also love to read. Um, but that day can come for any of us to have our eyes too dim to be able to read. Children can drill and quiz each other on topics like math facts or studying for tests. Um, and I know as I'm saying all this, some of you may be thinking, not my kids, not those two. You just have to decide how to pair your kids off and who it might help and who it might just create a big problem with and you're like, no, we're not going to try that. Or maybe next year we can try that, but not this year. Music. Um, Jim and I, neither one are musical at all, but I always wanted to play the piano, but we couldn't afford it. So we bought a very inexpensive piano at an auction and then poured $600 in it, into it to redo a lot of the work in it. And then the kids had piano lessons, which none of them loved, and um, but they had a great teacher, so they did learn. Um, but anyway, they could play other instruments. Daniel did choose one year out of a choice between homeschool basketball or guitar lessons because we could only afford one. He chose the guitar lessons, which turned out to be a blessing because that was the year Dennis Nan stopped coaching and the boys' basketball team stopped. So I was glad my son didn't have the disappointment of basketball stopping and him not getting to do it when he chose guitar. And we had all types of music playing in our house. We had ID, um, bird ID song tapes, musical instrument, how to identify this musical instrument. We had, um, dating us, we had cassette tapes on memorizing the states and capitals and books of the Bible, silly songs, camp songs, and of course psalms and hymns can always be going on in the, in the background or in the peaceful times of the afternoons just to get that calm back that may, you may have lost in the morning or you're afraid you're going to lose in the afternoon if they don't calm down. Um, create timelines for history. Um, we enjoyed that a lot, but allow lots of space more than you thought you needed. We ended up with an Iowa timeline that had this much crammed into this space and then nothing for here and then something here and then something further down. And so maybe it would help if you did a, a rough outline of what your timeline was going to look like before you rolled out the paper and started it. But we did enjoy timelines. We had put one on the wall in our living room of world history and one on biblical history and kind of line, tried to line them up as well as they could so you could kind of go, this is what happening in the world while this was happening in the Bible. And I think, um, I don't know if I was mentioned here, yeah, Gen Gen Genevieve Foster, I don't know if you're familiar with any of her books, um, the way she writes is like she'll take Abraham Lincoln, what was going on from the year he was born to the year he died in all parts of the world. And they're just paragraphs on each page. I love, I love her the way she's done that. And I don't think she only has about four books. Um, Columbus is one, Lincoln is one, and I can't remember any others. Um, but those are fun for history because they're short and because they're like trivia. They're just um, interesting things, to, especially if a child's not as interested in history or if you're not as interested in history. It can spur your interest too. Take walks, play outdoor games. Um, we played a lot of croquet when I was growing up as a child, and so that was something I wanted my kids to play when they were young, and they did, and they loved it. And I know you have to wait till, they're, till they can do it safely because those mallets are very dangerous. And so our daughter, we, we drew names at Christmas time, and our daughter gave our son, one of our daughters gave our son a croquet set when his children were a little bit too young to be doing that safely. And he's like, why did she give us a croquet set now? And the answer is, I don't know if I gave him that or not. She was looking back in her childhood, what did we do as a family that was fun that I want to share with your family? And so 
I need to ask him because they're the, the older two are seven and nine now, and the uh, and I think they could play safe enough if there was a lot of supervision. So maybe this summer I'll ask him. Do you still have that croquet set? Maybe it's time to get that croquet set out. And we played dangerous games when I was young, like the yard jarts. I don't know if any of you are old enough to know yard jarts, but they are actually large darts that fly through the air and that have damaged people. Um, I think they got rid of those, and now they're just like ring tosses and very not as exciting as yard jarts were. But um, I have a son-in-law who is a soccer coach, and so I've also seen him outdoors with his children teaching them the skills for soccer. Their yard is very small, so they're not going to play soccer other than a few. They have a, they have a little net thing, so they can play a little bit, but not very. Their yard's probably from there to there, and so it's not a very exciting soccer game. But I've watched him teach them those skills outdoors. Um, I also have played... I, did not, I don't remember if I ever played on the playground with my children, but I have played on the playground with my grandchildren. But I think they make playgrounds differently now than they did when I was little, because when I was little, it was just, there's the swings, there's the teeter-totter, there's the, the slide, and parents aren't going to usually go on those. But these playgrounds that they've got now are just amazing for adults and for kids. You can be on them with them, and um, that helps when they want you to be it on the, on the tag games, which we did some of that. And I definitely was it for a very long time went, uh, last summer. Um, another outdoor thing, my grandfather on my mother's side taught me when I was 13 how to garden. I loved gardening at that young age. We got to pick fresh produce when we were at their houses. He taught me how to plant tomato plants, how to fertilize them, how to prune them. And then we pl I planted them that summer when I was 13, and then we moved in July. And if you know, there's no tomatoes yet in July. But my mom touched base. We moved out of town. My mom touched base with the family that bought our house, um, and they said they got 300 tomatoes off my three plants, and they were still counting. That was August. And so um, you can learn to garden really well even when you're 13. So um, teach them those kind of skills outdoors as a family. Other family hobbies, um, I don't know if this is exactly a family hobby, but my grandmother on my dad's side um, gave me a love of house plants. And so I had house plants inside, and my kids helped transplant a couple of times inside the inside plants. Um, and I was only nine when she taught me how to love house plants. And my mom was very patient and gave me space to have house plants. My mom did not have house plants, but she gave me space to enjoy house plants at nine. Coin collecting is another one that might be a family um, hobby. Um, find ways your family can serve other people. And um, nurse, I mentioned about nursing care homes. Um, reading to them. We had a, I don't know if this is where I was going to say it or not, but we had a, I don't think it is. I'll wait. It'll come up. Um, involve extended family and church. So I've gone through young children and children out older and then the family and divide the family up and now involve extended family or church family. Some even might ask to help you. Um, figure out a way that they can help you. Um, what, no matter what it is, if it's drilling your kids on a topic they need, like their math facts, or, or doing some of the read aloud. Like if I was homeschooling right now, I'd have to borrow friends to read aloud, because I haven't been able to, I'm surprised my voice is hanging on, I haven't been able to read aloud to my grandkids since August, and so that's very sad to me. So, so friends might help you do that. Um, and I mentioned vision, and yes, bifocals. Um, they might give you help by just child care, as some of you meant, um, Olivia's mom mentioned about sometimes it might be nice just for somebody to let you have a whole morning to shower and do your hair and all that without somebody knocking on the door and asking for something in the bathroom. Um, as parents, we can suggest but allow the extended family and church family and friends to help without expectations, too. I um, stand back and watch those relationships develop. As a um, mom who really wanted to get things done, I would sometimes ask grandma to do things that, um, this is Jim's mom, just we lived down the lane from. I had expectations and hopes that things would go a certain way. Um, 
and they rarely did because she was doing her own thing too, and that was fine. And my kids have a great memory of, of doing a marching band to some jazz record on their old record player, um, and she had stairs that went up the front and down the back. So they just marched and marched and marched with Grandma. There were other things too that I wasn't always thrilled about that you're going to have to put up with too, like you, you don't want your friends extended friends and family and church family to give them too much sugar or things like that. Sometimes you just have to give and take and say, all right, it's okay, they'll heal. And we'll, we can move on from from not having all of our expectations met as we watch those relationships grow and develop. Um, that relationship was amazing for my kids to have. Uh, maybe it was a place, too, that they could go and mom wasn't there. That they didn't have the pressure of mom wanting this or that done, just grandma wanting to love on them and play with them. All right, and then miscellaneous. Use your library, story hours, extra programs. Um, we went to the library a lot, and the one I remember the most was the bird show, where the guy actually took his parrots and things into the library, and they spread a canvas out for the dog for the dew droppings and um, a feather. I collected feathers at the time. And one of the big blue birds, I don't know what it was, probably a very large parrot, um, lost a very large blue feather. And one of my kids said, Mom, Mom, look, look, there's a feather. Yeah, but I can't just go up and take the feather. He's doing the program. So we did ask later, could we, could we have? Oh, sure, I got, I got plenty of feathers. So fun things like that and are in your memory. Um, libraries are great resources. Um, plan friends dates. I think I've told you that before when I was on panels. Friends dates with whole families or trade kids or trade so that moms can be together with a few of the kids and dads can be together with a few of the kids so the moms can have some of the talks they want. And I mentioned nursing homes and care centers. You could also sing for them or give them one of your art projects or um, food you've made. That's where Margaret's name came in. I knew she was here somewhere. I had an elderly friend named Margaret Hayes who was in the nursing home when my kids were probably, oh, well, she died in 1994, I think, so they were three, five, and seven the year she died. So in those couple of years before that, we visited her in the nursing home about once a week, and we took her some bran muffins because she needed some help in that way, and she um, loved to just tell stories and encourage me, like, you know, once they can climb, you just let them climb, you know, things like that. Her, her sage advice of um, somebody who's already lived 90-some years when she passed. Um, that was, that was a, my kids still remember going to see her as a pleasant memory. So don't think that it might be just dragging your kids to a nursing home. I know COVID is really messed up being able to visit people in nursing homes. But do what you can, or elderly people who are still in their homes, too. You don't have to go to the ones that are already not, like, kind of almost off limits sometimes. But in their own homes, still some of them are lonely or, um, or have a lot to share with you. We did group activities like swimming, roller skating. We didn't do ice skating, but I'm sure that's available here somewhere. Uh, well, there is it at Coralville, the indoor. We did do that one. That was a, a $600 stitches ER, ER visit. on a, That was a homeschool field trip that cost a pretty penny. My son, I think it was $800 for eight stitches. So when he hit his head at college and got a big gash, he said, no, I'm not going to get stitches. It costs too much. And so he has a little scar from not going. He was, his decision, he was over 18 and he was making his own decision. Um, uh, nature classes, Stars Cave offers some things. We took the kids to one of the Stars Cave offerings in the summertime. Sometimes their interns are really good. Or I think right now they've got some really good interns and employees. They're doing a great job with the care of the park. I know that. The year I took my kids, there was a very immature intern there, and there was another gal there taking her grandson, and then I had my kids there, and we intentionally stayed as volunteers because we thought the intern needed some supervision as well. <laughs> And so sometimes the classes don't work out as well as you would like, but the, those resources are there. And Stars Cave is a beautiful place, especially they've got the extra trails that they did not have done when we were, when we were taking the kids there. So you can walk all the way out to the highway and back again. And it's only about two miles, so it's not that much if your kids are old enough to handle that. Um, and usually you can play in the crypt too. When some of the years we were going, there was too much... Um, I don't know whether it was nitrates or whatever was in the crick and they, bacteria, it was bacteria. And they, they test though and they tell you and they put up signs when you're not allowed to play in it. So 
sadly that was some of our disappointment sometimes. But um, I have waded in, I think, is that Flint Creek that runs through Stars Cave? Anyway, I have waded into that creek as recently as last year with some of my homeschool mom friends. So it's, it's even adults can take their walking breaks with their friends and do that. Um, field trips, there's so many places around in the area that you, you might not even ever have explored um, that are right under our noses. I did not know about Wildcat Den Park by Muscatine. That place is amazing. And so that's, that's a place that I've only been with friends. I've never been there with my kids yet. And I'd like to take them and the grandkids there. But we haven't exhausted Star's Cave yet with the ages that they are. The oldest is nine and the youngest is due in May. So there's still a lot of years left to go with that. Um, the hot air balloon show that's done in Fort Madison, the rodeos that are in Wapolo in Fort Madison. Um, some of you may know farms that you can go tour. There are art shows, and we've taken them to pet shows. The girls loved cats, and there were actually shows that had cats. They weren't doing tricks, but they were shows that had cats at them. So you can find all those things. And my husband's the one that reads the, used to read the paper. We don't take the paper anymore, but used to read the paper. Um, and then he would tell me all these things that were coming up, and, or my, or my mother-in-law did. And so we'd figure out what things we could afford to do time-wise and money-wise that were available. We did co-ops and team teaching, um, and you can trade. You can trade teaching. I know, um, and some people just volunteer to do. I think Ben Turner is doing had done something with Nathan. Did Nathan do some film editing or um, some video editing? That coding, but he did he create. Didn't Ben help him create you a birthday video or something too? Oh, Brian did that. All right. Um, and then John Smith in our church, he teaches at an education co-op up at Washington, and he teaches some of the heavy science-y stuff up there. So there's places available that if you're not feeling like you can do some of it, ask around. You might not have to drive that far to have a pretty um, extensive class to be able to take your kids to. That That's a grandfather of homeschoolers that's teaching that. His kids weren't homeschooled, and he taught at the college level, and then he's retired, and he's doing this, I think it's every Thursday. And they've done some apologia with every year is different. So they've done some of the Apologia um, and then they've done, I don't know what all. I don't, I don't know. Maybe some physics. I don't know. But find out who in your church or in your community has those skills that you feel inadequate for and that. So some of these things I'm telling you are about are just ways to l l reduce the stress too of your, and that will give you more joy and that will make homeschooling more fun if you can work with the stress of it all. Um, find opportunities for them to make presentations like reports or demonstrations or play their instruments or do a talent show. Um, we did all we did all of those things, um, not on a regular basis, not everything all at once, just as things came up. Um, find pen pals. When you can connect with a homeschool family from somewhere else on social media or through church camps or conferences um, or their own cousins that are at long distance, we had... Um, I met a few homeschool families at one of our international conferences when the kids could, the youngest could barely write. She was still writing on the lined paper with the dotted line in the middle to place her letters on. But they wrote back and forth to two or three different families, and one of those families Daniel became really good friends with at the college level. And so some of those friendships aren't just because moms want their kids to have a reason to write and um, without making these assignments that are boring and, and pointless. Those weren't boring and pointless. They, ex they were excited to get the mail that when it came back from those friends. Um, this advice came from my college professors to help me and the rest of us in the class. Break things up into small, manageable units. It's the whole, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time thing. When you're feeling overwhelmed, break it down, even if it means breaking your day down into minutes because you can't get through till noon. Break it down. What do I have to do in the next 15 minutes? What do I have to do in the next hour? I can do that. It's just like when you're starting a new habit. I can do that for three days. And then the third day, can I do that for three more days? I can do that for three more days. So um, there's an also a technique I learned that you can break it down. And some of you, I think, do it with timers set for your kids for some of their schoolwork. But this is a technique called the Pomodoro technique because I, I think Pomodoro is Italian for tomato and the timer that they used was tomato shaped. And so this, this was a, a college project that somebody did years ago and it's online. You can look up Pomodoro technique and you'll see it. Um, and it was 
used for college level, but you can adapt it down. And the point of the study was, you, you did, or the process was, 25 minutes on task, five minutes total free time. And as this is college level, do that four times and then give yourself 30 minutes break to do whatever you want to do. And what they found was the people were far more productive if they could know that there was a break coming, but they knew they were also going to focus for 25 minutes. Your kids are younger, they're not going to focus for 25 minutes. But you can set it as a lot smaller tax to what is their limit that they can do and then give them an equivalent amount or whatever you decide of free time and they can know that free time is coming um, and it may feel like, yeah, but we're wasting so much time. Well, not if you got a lot done in the time that they were working hard to get that reward at the end of the timer dinging. Um, all right. Drink. Thanks for your patience. Now we're going to go through a day. Um, one, get good sleep. All of you. Everything's more fun and more exciting when you're rested. Remember that good night I sleep I had last night? This talk is going far better than it did when I was sitting in the chair Thursday afternoon after spending hours on the talk. Um, I didn't save it to the last minute, honestly. I brainstormed the week before, and then that was my final notes. Um, but I, I was very tired trying to do that Thursday afternoon. But last night I had good sleep, and I could come here, and I could smile, and I could be excited. I could, I'm excited today. I could be excited to tell you all this fun stuff. Um, so get good sleep, all of you. Keep a routine, but be flexible. Um, open the Word of God for yourself, um, as well as for your children. Um, dads and moms both can do that. I have this verse that I had. It is water spotted, and it has pin marks through it because this was pinned to the curtain above the sink where we did dishes. Um, and it says, Thy words were found, and I ate them, and thy words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I have been called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah 15, 16. We all need the food of God's word every day. And so that's important. And then open scripture, I said, with your kids, dads and moms can do that. Either one, we farmed, so um, harvest and planting. There was no family worship most of the time. It was me reading scripture to the kids because he was not available except when they were sleeping. And we weren't going to change their sleeping habits to get the Bible reading in by the dad instead of the mom. We just worked our schedule around that to make sure that they could have God's word um, every day. And so we also had... Um, I still had them. I didn't know I still... I thought I still had them, but I, I didn't know if I'd find them. A verse for every letter of the alphabet that we started when they were learning phonics. And these all have the pin marks too because these all took their turn being pinned to the curtains because the kids would do dishes with me. And so, uh, and then after a while, then they had to come off the um, curtains and I just put them on this ring so we could review them. And when I read back through them, I thought, I still have all these memorized. And I didn't memorize near as fast as the kids did. So we worked on, on that memory work. Um, that was an idea I got from the gal who taught me how to teach. When I taught, I taught kindergarten for one year out at a Christian school in Virginia, and I had no experience yet teaching at all. And so that was one of the ideas that she had because we were teaching kindergarten and we were teaching phonics. And so she said, "Let's pick a verse that we can memorize every for every week." It was yeah, every week approximately. Um, nutrition. Keep learning and applying. If you're not healthy, you're not going to be happy. If you're not healthy, you're not going to have peace or, or um, the ability to get through that, that day because you're going to be too tired and all that. And So we all are learning a lot. Um, and I'll share a little bit of a personal example on that. I have had health issues for especially chronic pain since 2006. And I didn't know that my diet was a very important part of that problem. And I think my diet had set me up for that chronic pain. Um, and it was the standard American diet, for sure. 
Um, I did learn some healthy things along the way from some homeschool friends. Like in 98, I started grinding my own grain and making my own bread, which tasted amazing and didn't have all the preservatives in it, that kind of stuff. But it didn't really make any other big changes. We might have reduced our sugar a little bit. We might have added a couple more vegetables, something like that. But um, I didn't start getting more serious about my diet, my nutrition, until 12 years ago, and I'm 62. So don't wait that long, guys. The, the potential for health to decline is greater than you think based on your diet and lifestyle choices that you make. So you'll be much more able to have joy and peace and not be stressed if, and if you're not tired and not run down and, um, and if your kids aren't also tired and run down from their sugar high and then their sugar low. I will leave that. I'm sure open to any conversations everyone wants to have with me on that on the side because I have studied and done about everything, including I'm currently doing keto carnivore. And so it's a it's been a journey. The past 12 years have been a journey for the health, and it, but it's made a big difference. The past two months have probably made more difference in my health than all that I did for the 12 years before. So it, everything you try might be the... Um, the golden thing that you didn't know is out there that, that you say, wow, this is, the, this is what I really needed to be doing clear way back. Well, it's a process and it's a journey. Um, ask my kids when, they, when I took sugar away from them when they were too young to understand that was not a, I, was not, I was not their best friend for a long, long time. They understood, but they, and eventually they got more of their sugar back because I couldn't live with the, with the, with the, we, yeah, anyway, that you can imagine. Just I'll leave that to your imagination. Um, and encourage kitchen skills. Um, I have an amazing daughter-in-law named Abigail. She's married to my son, Daniel. We have a photo of Violet at age two years, two months, stirring the stuff that goes into the pumpkin pie. Two years, two months, and she didn't spill. I mean, we don't, we don't give our little kids credit enough. We don't give them experience or opportunity enough. They can do all these things. Maybe not sharp knives, but, um, but they can do these things that a lot younger than we think they can. And so give them those opportunities, even though that means it's going to take you a lot longer in the kitchen to do um, the things that you could whip out in half an hour. It may take you an hour and a half if you're having the help of a child. Um, Sadie is Violet's sister, and she just got a, a youth cookbook at Christmas time, and so she insisted that Grandma and and uh, she were going to make recipes. First one we made was a uh, an apple spice cake to take to church, but she was really sad that I couldn't have any because I couldn't eat gluten or dairy, and so she told her mom, and her mom told me she really wants to make a recipe that you can eat. Well, that was really stretching it because I'd already started the keto carnivore thing. <laughs> But I, I stretched it, and I said, let's make an all-fruit-only smoothie. I can do, I'll can i do one serving of fruit. Let's do that. And so she was happy to be able to experience that with Grandma. And, she, and measuring was the big thing she wanted to do. We had no recipe. And she goes, wait, 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 we have to have a recipe. I said, no, but we'll measure. We'll measure. And so we got out the fruit and the measuring cups and all that, and she got to measure, and that was okay. And then... Fabian just turned seven, and he got to help make his own birthday cake. I was 10 before I was given permission to make my own birthday cake. So he was really excited that he had done that. He'd made his cake. Okay, now we've gone from fun kitchen things now to chores, because we're going to have to clean up the kitchen. Um, and with chores, they have to start somewhere. I know that Nadia and Fabian at probably four and six, they were putting away and loading up the dishwasher. And I asked my daughter where some certain mugs were. And she goes, yeah, well, the kids are helping load and unload the dishwasher. And so some of those mugs aren't, uh, we don't have them anymore. They're, they've, they've broken. And uh, Miles is two. And he was with us at Christmas. And they've taught him at two to clear the table. And so they will hand him the dishes. And he, and he can carry them over. And he can't see the counter. But he can push them up onto the counter. And so he did that. Well, my daughter gave him a glass at our house to take to the counter. And then she changed her mind and because he seemed to not know where the counter was and said, T at, at any rate, he wasn't sure where he was going, but he took off like lightning with this glass and he was going to put it where he thought he was supposed to put it. And up it went. And I'm sitting clear quite a while, probably as far as you are to me. And I'm like, no, 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 stop, 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 stop. Because I could see it was going to go right into the sink and break. 
And Molly says, I should have lent my voice to it because he would have stopped if I'd said it. Because, But my voice, he wasn't recognizing it at all. It, he was just, Mommy told me to do this. I'm going to go do this. And up it went and crash. He screamed and cried. I, cr- I felt bad that he felt bad. Um, but he did a fun thing. He, and so I cleaned all, sink is great. I was glad that broke in the sink. Sink's easy to clean a broken glass out of. So I cleaned it up, put it in a bag, and he's in his mom's arms drying his tears. And I shook the I shook the bag of the broken glass, and he loved that sound, and he started giggling. I went, done, good. That was, that was a fun lesson to learn for all of us, that the kids can do these tasks, but they don't always know how. They don't always do it the way we think they're going to do it, and they're going to be breakage. It's just the way it's going to be. Um, the Pilling Girls also, they, there are four of those. Violet is nine, Sadie is seven, Thea is four, and Adele is six months, seven months, so she's not helping yet. But the three older girls were clearing the table, and I remember saying to Daniel, wait a minute, last time we were here, we're only there every six months. I cleared the table. What's going on? He says, Mom, we're trying. We're really trying. And they were doing a really good job. Even, even Thea was carrying, the four-year-old was carrying things. I thought, there's no way. She's going to that. She's gonna drop that. And they have tile floors. Nothing survives a drop on a tile floor. I mean, ceramic tile floor. But she did it. And it, she, I was just amazed at the things that they can do a lot younger. I don't remember how old the kids were when I gave them chores. I probably gave them ones that could not create messes or break, because that's who I am. But I should have given them more, because they could do it. Do chores as a family or in teams. Many hands make work light. It's um, it's easy to um, assign your chores to your kids and just make them go do it, and then they'll forget, and then you get upset because they forgot. Well, if they have their chores and you're working together in the same room, they're not going to forget. You're all doing your tour together, and then it's done, and you can all go do the things you really wanted to be doing other than chores. So figure out different ways that your family can get your chores done that makes it not a drudgery, makes it they're not forgetting all the time to get their chore done. Um, I will tell you that my son at the table said, now girls, what is the chore you're going to do after dinner without me reminding you to do it? Because they were still learning how to do it. And he didn't want to name the exact chore. He was still hoping that they would remember which chore it was. Seated academic work, Um, break it up. I mentioned the Pomodoro technique. Um, Our bodies are meant to move, and movement helps the brain function. Um, There's even a movement class in this brain retraining class that I'm taking. Yesterday was the movement part of the class because the brain needs to move. The brain needs the body to move. I have a pet peeve about having children sit for long periods of time. Um, It's just not natural. They're not meant to sit. We're not meant to sit. We're all meant to move around, but um, our lives are not that way anymore. But theirs can be, that they can still be given permission to spend more time moving around. Um, And with that, there's a book, I don't know if I remember the author, but it's on learning styles. And that was a game changer for us to... um, allow the children to have the environment that learn that they learn best in. And usually this was had to do with them doing their own schoolwork when they could do work independently. So one of them could lay on her stomach on her bed with the radio playing and get all her schoolwork done well. Um, they could take blankets outside and, and hold cats on their laps and get their schoolwork done well. Um, I think my son was more like me. He needed to sit at the table. He needed not have music and anything going on in the background to get his work done. We're all different for how we learn best and how we can focus best. It's not None of us are the same, which makes it hard if your house is not big enough to have everybody spread out and do their own thing. But um, once they had their bedrooms, then people could be in the living room, the bedroom. I say once they had their bedrooms because we lived in the four-room house first with one our bedroom, and one bedroom for the three kids. So things at first weren't as spread out as they were when we built our new addition. So sometimes I know your space is limited, so you have to just do what you can. Um, I want you to notice that I have never once told you to make your homeschooling joyful or more exciting by using a smartphone or an iPad or a tablet or a computer. Not once have I mentioned that because I really want to encourage you to limit the exposure to a computer, iPad, tablet, cell phone, video, TV time to a minimum, yours and theirs. Um, We can't compete with addictive programming. All those devices, the software is written to addict us and and it's getting worse. Um, 
If we don't limit it, it will become an addiction. And the rest of our daily life will pale in comparison until we get that screen again. And I know that, um, and I'll, before I, um, it also does change their brains, our brains. There's books and studies on it. I've seen it in my own life. I used to be able to pick up a book this thick, not even breathe a sigh, just pick it up and read it and read it for hours. And I'm not talking fiction. I'm talking I could read books for long periods of time. I have lost my attention span for reading, and I don't think it's because I got older. I think it's because my brain is used to snippets online, and I can't focus, and then I'll click this, and I'll click that, and I'll click this, and I don't have to read anything all the way. That's good enough. So it's changed my brain. And when children are exposed to a lot of that, as young as they are, it can make permanent changes. They can't change back if their brains were molded that way at that young age. Um, and I still have, I, I have a current battle with the screens. Um, I'm sensitive to electromagnetic fields, so that is a barrier for me. But I have a house with no Wi-Fi and a hardwired laptop, or a hardwired, hardwired desktop. So I can still sit for hours on the internet without being affected by the electromagnetic fields of a cell phone. So even, even that um, disappoints me in myself, um, that the habits that I've gotten into, I'm alone all day long. Um, so I, I have made friends online, I type messages online, I type emails online, and I read a lot online, I listen to things while I'm working around the house. Um, but a lot of it's tied to the screen. And, it, and it, so I will admit that it is an addiction. So I have a carb addiction. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I have a carb addiction since I was a very young child. And I have a screen addiction right now um, that has various ways that it expresses itself. And because of both of those, I experienced some, I won't say deep, but it was deeper than I would like, depression this past fall. Because when you have addictions, you have anxiety, you have depression, oftentimes it just comes in and it, and it surprises you and it's really hard to get out of that unless you break the addiction. And I, with this keto carnivore, that's what um, I've seen happen. Right now I'm not having any issues with the carb addictions. I, they may come again, but um, right now I'm not having those. I still have the screen addictions, but I have broke away from some of the time that I've been spending on the computer, and I've been trading it for something that I've been wanting to do that I haven't done as much of in the past two or three years, and that's go back to my exercising and stretching that I do love to do, but couldn't get myself away from the screen to do. And so, and I also like to listen to health information and other types of information, and I wanted to get myself away from that, too, because then you're always running to the computer to find something more to listen to. And I have music to play, so I, I thought, no, you're going to do your stretching and your strengthening, playing music in the background and calming your body rather than getting your body hyped up, listening to the talk you're trying to listen to that's really hyping you up while you're trying to do this exercising to relax and calm the body and strengthen the body. All right, another love I have, we'll switch from a, an addiction to a love, I love being outdoors. Get your family outdoors as much as possible. Create safe places in your yard for them to explore um, um, or other people's yards if you don't have much of a yard. Um, I know that the Schneider's kids have a crick in the back and parents have let the children go alone as long as they have the walkie-talkies. So they've created a, what they feel some of the older generation doesn't feel it as much, but what they feel is a safe place for their children to go as long as they take the walkie-talkies and the batteries are charged. Um, uh, there is somebody in my generation, though, that's all for it. So I'm not the only... So there are... There's just... Um, and then Laura Turner's family, they have a crick also, and theirs is within yelling distance, so she doesn't have to do the walkie-talkie thing. But we went for a walk there last fall, I think, when I was there. Usually my visit's there. I think I've only done one visit in the house. When, I'm, when I stop by their house, we walk all around outside, and they show me the chickens, and they show me the work on the shed and those things. We were down at the creek, and I said, ask Laura a question. She goes, I haven't been down here. This is the kids' place. This is where they come. And 
And I, I thought, yeah, our kids really do need a space, a place where they can safely be and a parent doesn't have to be right there. Because we think that they're always with us and that we always have to deal with them, but they always have to deal with us too. And they need some space to be just kids in a safe manner, but just to be just kids without having that pressure of somebody's looking over my shoulder, somebody's going to remind me of a chore, somebody's going to tell me, oh, I got these wrong on my test today, and I just some space where their brains can be free of all of that too. Um, give kids free time and resources to explore their own interests. I recently showed Livia a video that our daughter Emily created. We'd given her video, so we had a video camera, we gave her software to do video editing. She did all the filming and all the editing for a video that she was in um, all over the farm with some movement and the farm scenes and all to the background of, of a, with a song in the background called Innocence. And I still cry every time I look at that video. Her talent and her skills in that video. And if we had not let her have this really expensive video camera that my husband bought for the family to just go out, and she's 14, so she was responsible enough, but she could go do that. If I had not given her that, and if we had not bought that, I don't know whether she bought the software or we bought it, I don't remember that. And given her the time she needed to do all that. It takes a lot of time to do video editing, a lot. So if you can, give them the resources to explore their own interests. Eat as many meals as you can together around a table. I grew up in front of a television. It's not unusual that I would have screen addictions since I grew up eating in the living room in front of the television with our family. Um, in the 1960s, it was TV dinners, and it was a busy mom with five kids born in five years' time. And so mom wasn't wanting around the table. And we had a small house, so maybe the table was filled with other things she was working on with the kitchen. I don't know. kitchen was small, too. Um, it's through that time as at family meals where you might learn to the kids might learn to communicate and do give and take and listen to each other. I find that in my Sunday school class, I'm like, wait, yeah, you can't all talk at once. You can't all talk when I'm talking. But if you're at the ta at dinner table, you can teach them what does that give and take look like? What is that listening to this person and listening to this person and then asking these questions of your family, that, that can be a really special time. We, um, our daughter, one of our daughters has a smaller um, home too, and so table space is also at a premium in their house. And the seven-year-old's birthday that we were at in February, he said he wanted the whole family to sit around the table. So we figured a way that all six of us, the, the, his parents and his sister and him and Jim and I, could sit, and we were able to elbow at this small little table, but we sat around the table at two of the meals we were there on the weekend because Fabian wanted that for his seventh birthday. Let's all eat around the table, not just the kids at this table and the parents at this table in the living room, but make it work if you can, at least one meal of, of your day um, around a table. Um, you might also figure out what some of their struggles and interests are during that time. Uh, remember, we're going through the day here. So also I'm going to pause here and work on your marriage because you're going to be a wife all day long and all night long too. So work on your marriage. A solid marriage lends to stability beyond your imagining. If your children hear you or see you have a challenging conversation with your spouse, try to make it so that they can also see that you're okay again. I grew up in a home that... Uh, my family of origin, my parents were divorced by the time I was 11, but there was a lot that happened between about age 8 and 11. And so um, those are traumas if they continue on like that. If there's a pattern of not working, things going well in your marriage, work on that because that's, that's going to show up in your kids. It, it, it does. Um, so do what you can to work on your marriage because every day is going to be better if you can do that. Um, but I will say too, that even though that was trauma for me, the Lord can heal and he does restore what the locust has eaten. And so there's always healing too. If you feel like you've traumatized your kids already because they saw a week's worth of really rough times with you and your husband, you have not traumatized them for the rest of their lives. They can recover. And especially when they still have that stable home that's still, and it's a God-centered home. My home was not a God-centered home. I did not, learn anything about the Lord in my home of growing up years at all. So you all have that as your foundation and that's everything. So
And then by the end of the day, if you have not opened God's word with your children or with yourself, even though you're tired, try to read at least one verse. It's a relationship with the Lord. It's a, converse, it's a conversation and, and pray. And um, not because it's a magic potion, not because you want to check it off. That's me. Check it off your to-do list and say, well, they're good. I can say that I read God's word today because I read a verse. Um, it is a relationship with the Lord. And um, Proverbs 10.22 was a verse that was prayed. I... I got to experience, when I became a believer at age 14, I got to experience what family worship was in the home of the family that led me to the Lord. And they actually got down on their hands and knees and knelt. And there was, it was a three-generation home. And the elderly man, the father of the father of the home, he prayed and he quoted this verse every single prayer. So I have it memorized because he quoted it. Proverbs 10, 22, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and he adds no sorrow to it. And so... The blessing of one verse at the end of the day, it's rich, it, and he adds no sorrow to it. So there's no reason to feel guilty you didn't read a chapter, or you, you got behind on your reading plan and you didn't read, or you forgot to read to the kids that night, or whatever. God's word and, and our relationship with him is a blessing, and he doesn't add sorrow to it. It's all a blessing. And with that, have a bedtime routine. Our son in New York reads aloud to his kids once they're all tucked in, um, and their house is easy to hear, not the words, but the intonation of the words from floor to floor. And so I'd be in the living room, and I can hear him playing the voices of the characters as he's reading aloud to the kids. And he's read everything. To, he's read from the Little House on the book, Prairie books to The Hobbit to all those different fun books that, um, that I read to my kids. And so um, it's just exciting to pass that on to generations. A bedtime routine, and that's part of his. Our daughter Emily sings to her children a little bit, or they sing a song together. Um, when you're the grandma and you're the one tucking them in and the parents aren't there and you're asked to sing the song and you don't know the song, that, then bedtime routine can be really hard because I don't know that routine. And so I very much disappointed Nadia at age three a year or so ago, Grandma, you don't know any of the songs. Not the ones your mom sings, sorry. So I got the same from the New York girls one year too, that I didn't, we'd switched psalm books. And I knew the psalm versions in the old psalm book, but not in the new psalm book. And they had learned on the new psalm book. And so I was like, I'm sorry, I don't know those words. Um, and then my last point on the family, on the, and going through your day, get sleep. Again, all of you, I started with that point, I'll end with that point. Get sleep. Get sleep. And so now I have some resources in case I overwhelmed you. Um, there is a book. At, I have asked for it on interlibrary loan from the Meepo Library. It is only in Ankeny. is the only place in Iowa that has that book. So it's coming to the Meepo Library on interlibrary loan. They may get it. Um, if enough of you wanted to look at it, I will... I will um, I'm going to... I got it because because it looked like her approach might help setting any kind of goals, not just homeschool goals, and I'd hoped that it would be here by today so you could look at it, but it's not. Um, It's called Minimalist Homeschooling, A Value-Based Approach to Maximizing Learning and Minimizing Stress. It had 4.5 stars with 194 reviews on Amazon, and here's the review of it, or the description of it. Remove the clutter in your child's education by taking a deeper look at how you invest your time and energy. Homeschooling does not have to mean a crazy, busy life of too much to do, too much to buy, too much to plan. You don't have to choose between excellence and sanity while homeschooling. You can have both. Minimalist homeschooling will have you rethinking your priorities and your perspective to create a simple, focused, and meaningful homeschool based on the minimalist mindset and approach. Uniquely, Minimalist Homeschooling offers 15 thought-provoking worksheets so readers can purge their tasks, schedule, curriculum, and supplies with clarity and confidence. There is a way for your children to learn more while doing less. And the friend that recommended that is a mom of a only child who she homeschools. He's eight and a half now. She and I met her online, and we met at a I was in Toledo, and she came down from Detroit, and we met at a zoo while her son was four, and we spent the day together. Um, she recommended the book. She said it has been night and day for her homeschooling. Even homeschooling just one child, things can get out of hand. And so um, she said, no, I definitely recommend that, that book. I've changed so much just in this past few months since I've read the book. 
Um, there's also three articles, and I will point, I will post the links to these three articles in the Facebook group um, under the under this, either under today's announcement or under the live stream. And it's three articles from um, Homeschooling Today magazine, and they are home minimal. It's a minimalist homeschooling series, um, decluttering our hearts, how to stop the more monster, and how to declutter your homeschool area. So it has emotional and spiritual, and it has the the whole homeschooling get out of hand. My getting out of hand was at the homeschool conference with all the curriculum options that I wanted to try and that I have a shelves full that I some of them didn't even open. Um, I still have some of them. I think that is all unless you have any questions for me and I've given Olivia some discussion questions for the last... And I talked longer than I thought because I found lots more examples as I was talking than I thought I would. would. So if there are any questions or comments. Okay. Um, I have a... Let's see. When we're when we're clear done with the with the discussion, I have one more announcement to make after Olivia shuts off the recording later. Thank you so much, Sharon, for sharing your many ideas. I think we've got a a whole lot of stuff we can take home and just keep in mind, and especially the reminder about going to nursing homes too. That really stuck out with me. I, really need to try to make more of a point to do that if I can. So our next meeting will be um, April 14th, not the 7th, which was in my phone. <laughs> so in case yours is off too. So our next meeting will be April 14th. We'll have Susan Gerst coming to speak. She raised um, seven kids and homeschooled, I believe all of them throughout um, their years, uh, maybe some dual enrolling, but, but she's got a lot of experience um, and she's going to talk about siblings and relationships. So so yeah, we'll be looking forward to seeing you then. So thanks.